Today's guest is one of my very best friends out here. He's a producer based out of Burbank, California at this time. He is one of the most phenomenal producers. He is a fantastic musician, very musical. He's a neighbor. He's a friend. I've been mixing a lot of his production. I think all of his productions for the last year or so. Um, and I could tell you straight, straight from being in the being in the trenches with him, this guy has what it takes. I'm very excited to announce him and bring him on the very first episode of this new segment of Mixing It Up with Daddy D. Welcome to the show, Mike McClellan. Welcome back to your favorite segment of the Mixing Music Podcast. You are listening to Mixing It Up with Daddy D. Well, I mean, tell me about uh, how long did it take for you to learn Portuguese, Brazilian oh, Portuguese? Okay, man. so were you, uh, were you pretty quick on it? Well, this is for for those who don't know. Um, I was a, an LDS missionary, and I went to Brazil. And there's a training center where you go, and you uh, you already know this, mm -hmm. but but maybe you learn the language. Yeah. You uh, yeah, you, you learn, learn the language and like how you're supposed to teach people and stuff. Um, I got to show you a headline after this that I okay. thought was hilarious. All right, go ahead, go ahead. So um, you're supposed to be in the training center for like two months, and at that point you go to your uh, area that you're assigned to work in. And it's not expected that you'll be fluent at this point, but like conversational enough to get by. And uh, I actually was bumped up to like, instead of being with the Americans in the training center, they put me with a group of Brazilians because I was doing well enough with the language. For real? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's like a Latin based language, so it's not like... Well, I took some some Spanish. Hey, I'm not taking yeah. away that it's a, that you're smart. You know, I know that you're smart, Look, but I, also... What I did, superhuman. <laughs> I'm, just, no. <laughs> I'm not taking that away from you but also no portuguese is really cool you're not learning finnish dog you know? no no it's not mandarin or anything no um but anyway yeah after they put me with the brazilian group it became like exponentially harder because nobody could hold my hand at that point anymore and i was just like really depressed after that because i couldn't understand anybody and it was hard so how long did it take me i don't know i was probably conversational by Two months in, just because it's like full immersion experience. You know, I was fluent after a few months. A few months? Yeah. When did you start plateauing, would you say? Plateauing? Like plateauing in language where it's like, oh, okay, I'm native enough. Like like, like daily practice is not making me. Oh, man. You know, I don't know. Like, it was so long ago. Um, like within six months, within a year? Maybe. I was, I was doing pretty good after six months. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy, yep. man. And now it's all. I've never, I've never had like the opportunity to like. I've never taken seriously learning another language. I mean, I know how to say like "give me your money" like in Spanish because of Duolingo. <laughs> so when did when did you learn English? Because because Japanese is your first, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you learn it like really really young, or did so it come later? My white dad, who speaks Japanese, you know what? I don't think I he spoke Japanese. Yeah, when we lived in Japan, he spoke Japanese, and he's really good at Japanese. He's one of those like freakish white people that like. He's like one in a thousand, I guarantee you. Like, I've never met another white person that speaks his Japanese as well as he does. And I've met a lot of white people that speak Japanese, which is a funny thing to say. Uh, he's, he's, it's kind of uh, intense. Um, but yeah, I didn't speak English until I moved to the States. So it was like kindergarten. Kindergarten. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Kindergarten, I started. And that's young enough where like I got the plasticity still going. Yeah. So do, was it like That's work? why I don't have an accent, I think. Do you remember being frustrated by it? Or no, not like at all. working on it, practicing? No, not at all. It just all happened yeah, kind of yeah, naturally. Yeah, yeah. Kind of happened. Yeah. Um, yeah, I still had that like cognitive plasticity. If you, I if guess you could I learn sponge. another one, what would you learn? Hmm. Well, it depends. Are you... Like, if I can learn anyone, it depends on what I'm going for. Like, am I learning for business? Then I'd want to learn either, like, Chinese. You're learning for the pure joy of just having a third tongue. I would love to dig deep into, like, probably another Asian language, like Korean or Chinese. Okay. Probably Korean before Chinese. Mm-hmm. Um, or, like, Tagalog. Oh. Tagalog would be fun to learn because I yeah. love Filipinos, man. The Pinoys, right. man. I love them. And uh, they got some food that is bad for you, dog. It is so bad for you. 
but that's how you know it's good right yeah that's how you know it's yeah. good and uh yeah one time i was like <laughs> no I, I thought i wanted to learn some like some like yiddish or hebrew you know just to like that would have been cool yeah that'd be sick kind of like network with some people it's kind of like yeah that would that would have been cool but also like not really useful <laughs> like, like <laughs> In general, like, I, mean, I don't know. I uh, said for the pure joy of having a third time. For the time, pure joy, so whatever floats like, your boat. Maybe like, yeah, I don't know. If I get into K-drama, what about you, man? What would you, what would you say? Um, I think a lot about switching to Spanish. Um, because but you're like halfway there. You're like 70. Well, that's the thing. If I, I feel like what I've heard from other people who've done this is that if you switch from Portuguese to Spanish, you will kind of lose your Portuguese. It's really hard to maintain both. Mm, um, really? Obviously, Spanish would be way more useful. In the States. Because I'm surrounded by people who speak Spanish and it could be very useful. And I would really enjoy like being able to talk to more of my neighbors in a, a, a fuller way. Yeah, wait. But I like <laughs> Portuguese is just like has such a soft spot in my heart. Dude, Carnival. Special man. place in my heart. <laughs> Dude, Carnival, man. I don't know. Uh, well, where, where in Brazil did you live? Did you live in the city? The Northeast. In the, I have no concept of if that is rural uh, or if that is. Yeah, it's city. pretty rural. There, pretty rural. there were a couple big cities, but most of the time I was in the, yeah, out in like, the country. It's so rural. People were like, like still figuring out how to fertilize corn. No, I mean, I mean, there's kind of there's a level rural. of poverty out there, but um, no, it, I, they're using sundials on their wrists. They had to get into it's a more like uh, if you think of like the American South. It's kind of like that is the northeast of Brazil. American South. Yeah. Okay, so like in what way? Um they got a they got a accent? Yes, they have they have an accent and, you know, love to all my northeasterners out there. Uh it's kind of collo- like known throughout the rest of Brazil as being kind of like kind of like a redneck. Are accent. they also nicer out there? Uh yeah, I mean, that's I mean the stereotype well, that's it's kind of southern like southern hospitality. The further north you go, the nicer people get, is what they would always say. Oh, for you know? real? Yeah. So, wow, I got people, some family in the south, nice. man. I got some family in oh. the south. Well, also the they further south you go, people. I'm not gonna... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, that because Japan and Brazil have a really close relationship because of the right. war. Yep. yep. Lots of I have I have Okinawan family in Brazil. Okay, I met Japanese people in Sao yeah. Paulo. Yeah, and I had to learn Portuguese a little bit on my on my mission in Japan because. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. I don't yeah. remember any of it. I took French in high school. Rice. Like, that remember was... rice? Rice and beans? Yeah. Uh, uh, Feijon. That's beans. Feijon. Yeah. And uh, rice. <laughs> Ahos. Ahos. Ahos y feijon. Ahos y feijon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. To yeah. the bain. Mm. Yeah. Chin chin. Also, uh, chin chin in Japanese means uh, wiener, but it's like a childish way of saying penis. It's like chin chin. Like, so it's like, like wiener. So yeah, it's like wiener, dude. <laughs> so it's like whenever yeah. like Brazilians would gather around these Japanese, people, they'd be like chin chin. Japanese people like because they're perverted. Japanese people right, are. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what's 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 urine in Japanese? Urine. Yeah. Well, in which version of it? Shiko. Like like, like pee? like we like to wee wee. Shiko shiko suru. Okay. Two two shiko two two shiko suru. Shishi. Shishi. Oh, shishi, yeah. sir. That's, that's a yeah. childish way of saying it. Yeah, yeah. Same For thing. real, mm-hmm. really? Crazy, man. We must have gotten that. Oh, we say pung for bread. Oh. I think that's like from pung. Brazil, right? Yeah. Pung. Yep. We also love flan. I don't know if that's Ooh. Portuguese or Brazilian. That must be European. Like, flan. went back and forth. I don't yeah. know. Anyway, um, so this headline, this is hilarious to me. Right. In Florida, this is real. Florida it's, man. It's just, it's just, it's just a, a clickbait headline. It says, Florida is holding stakes to use CLT instead of SAT as an, as an alternative to the SAT. Um, weighing, so basically it's like a classical and Christian version alternative of the SAT. Oh. And when I read this on Instagram, there's a Bloomberg post or something like that. Uh-huh. The number one comment was like, Hey, I can help you get the top points. All the answers are Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and I, th- I just thought that was so funny. Do you remember doing preparing for the SATs or anything like that? Uh, I remember taking tests in high school. Do you remember remember yeah. when like that was like your whole life? And now we're like, I haven't taken a test mm. in like it feels like a decade. I give the tests now. Oh, that's right. You're a teacher. <sighs> yeah, that's right. How does it feel like yeah. judging people for money? Judging people for money? <laughs> Literally judging Amazing. their future, yeah. determining their future for money. Dude. No, like, um, <laughs> for real though, gra- grading is not the fun part. 
I, I hate grading and I'm a non-confrontational person by nature. So like, um, being, whenever there's like an element of subjectivity in grading, I have a little panic attack. Like, well, I mean, it's also yeah. music. It's not like there's a right and wrong answer. I, I assume you're kind of, is that, oh, there is. Like there's some is this a, some is this submissions a, that are is this a dynamic ass. or a condenser microphone? Oh, I see, you know? I see. Yeah, uh, can't be both. Can't be both. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The the trick crash trick answer. This is a ribbon microphone. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> turn the phantom off. Turn the phantom off. No, we're good. We're good. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, no, yeah, yeah. Like no, there are, there are icon? like because I teach songwriting sometimes. Songwriting is more. Oh, they got you flex teaching more subjective. Classes. Yeah, whereas like the studio technical stuff is more objective. So, yeah, but there are times when it's like. Do you enjoy it? Yeah. Do you feel like you're a natural teaching? Teacher? Oh, I love it. Really? Yeah, it's challenging. It's Were difficult. Were you a good student? Yeah. I'm, Why I'm did a, you say that's so disappointing? You're like, yeah. I'm a, I'm a people pleaser. I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> what? I was raised to be good. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not people pleasing. That's just like. You were disciplined. I did not get in trouble. Dude, I don't think did not I get ever, bad grades. Dude, I think I like my senior year of high school, I literally I remember counting. I think I did homework three times the entire year. <laughs> like I'm not kidding. It might have been two, dude. I had this canny ability yeah. to like I didn't I didn't go up to the teacher and like, you know, brown nose or anything. I just did like really well on my tests. Yeah, dude. Senior was great. I like also did advanced math all through high school. So like I didn't take a math class my senior year. Like the 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 point of the advanced classes was to like do like a college level class. See, I'm smart. So I decided just, to just not yeah. do math. <laughs> so, so you're a genius. So you didn't have to study. That's cool. I'm on board. No, I'm here for it. No, I, yeah. I sucked at school, bro. I did so bad. I did not. I no. Here's the thing. I sucked, but I still enjoyed it. Well, school's fun because, like, it um, it gives you a, a crowd to hang out with, especially like music school, right? It's like what uh, kind of crowd did you hang out with, Mike? In Who college crowd? or in high school? We'll do like it's high school different. when it like it didn't matter, like when it felt real. Like in high school, it felt like clicks and like crowds was like a very serious thing. Oh. Like it was like a major part of our lives. So in high school, I was a like a hundred percent theater kid. I was always in a play. I was always taking drama classes. And when I wasn't in a play, I'd, I'd like go hang out with the people in a play. I was always like, hold on, were you yeah. the type of theater kid that was like? cool or were you the type of theater kid where like your parents were concerned how am about i you? supposed to know were your parents I, concerned that's the about point you? of being a theater kid is you don't know whether you're cool or not and it doesn't matter you just did, did your parents yeah. think you were cool uh <laughs> the, this is a trick you question know, by you know, the way it, it, funny enough <laughs> it, it never came up <laughs> mother uh, father am i cool <laughs> no that didn't come up ever that's I should a, ask them now. I, yeah, you should. You should. Was ask I them. cool in high school? I don't know. I was in plays. Yeah. Didn't do any sports. Did you have Not a least a favorite sport. play? Uh, least favorite play. Did you have a least favorite play? Yes. Yes. I was okay. So my sophomore year, I was in this weird avant-garde mashup of the Oresteia trilogy from Greek mythology. I, dude, you've already. That sounds boring. It sounds. It, was, yeah. it sounds horrible. Okay. Well, and high school kids wait, doing it? Wait to the part where um, I kissed my sister and murdered my mom and was driven crazy by uh, the, the Furies who pursued me into madness. So it, there was some Is drama to it. Is the start of your, like... I was in the play. <laughs> your chaotic music <laughs> career? Like this triggered Explains so much, right? <laughs> Look at me. Look at me. I'm nuts. Certifiable. Uh, it's all because of sophomore year doing a weird-ass <laughs> Greek play. <laughs> No, it, it was it was awful because it was uh, that it was, sounds awful. I'm not gonna lie. To you. It, it was it was very like it was very out there. It was yeah. we had this uh, guest director from Portland who was in like the Portland theater scene, and she he was, like did that for fun. She she, she did that. Yes. Yeah, oh, she was having a great time. Oh and, man, um, that's like another level of crazy. Yeah. Imagine watching not like amateur high school kids do something that is way too complicated for their brains. And that's yeah. like sadistic of her. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's like, <laughs> like reveling in the in the fury. I I have a feeling that if I were to approach that situation today, I would probably be more into it and be like, you know well, what? Of course, we're this is, this is genuinely interesting what we're doing. Oh, of as course. as a high schooler, I was just like, this is crazy. But that's like the point. Yeah, yeah. that's the point. So have you? By the way, on a separate note, yeah. Have you ever watched like Greece recently? No. 
Dude, it is very sexual. <laughs> It is like, well, I knew that. No, no, I, I kind of forgot about how wild it is. The, the dude's like talking about coming in two minutes, like to thirty seconds. I I'm like, that man, dude. I'm talking about coming, dude. Okay, we're going there. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Have you heard of uh, like? Did you ever watch Bye Bye Birdie? Bye Bye Birdie. Bye Birdie. It's no. another one like my that's, that's my, one like, I my white grandma like yeah. really loved growing up. Never it's saw good. that it's one. Good, the music's good. I kind of grew up watching a lot of musicals because of my like white side of my family, mm -hmm. and they were really into that. Um, I was never a musical theater kid myself, but I like watched, and we've always we've done like a lot of plays, and we've been to Broadway, things like that. And uh, so you're a theater yeah. kid too, is what you're well, saying? Well, watcher, and uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I Deep enjoyed down, it. you're a theater kid. I enjoyed kid. this music. Yeah, Bye Bye Birdie had good music, but also another really like weirdly sexual mu movie. But Birdie is like like an Elvis, and they're all like fawning over him. And like every other like minute is a sex joke. And I'm like, my grandma showed me this. Like my conservative Christian grandma's favorite movie is like cracking sex jokes I mean, that's... every two minutes I mean, with like 14 year old girls as the character. <laughs> but that's that's like Shakespeare too, you know? Oh yeah, it's rope, like, rope. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like I think the thinking is that kids won't get the stuff they're not supposed to get. Nah, duh. I don't There's know if like that's a true level of not. awareness that I think yeah. I had when it's like reading Fahrenheit 451. I was like, God damn. Like, that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I know most of it dark. went over my head. So, no, nah, um, yeah. what there was a lot of things that didn't go over my head. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of anything right now. <laughs> I just gotta think about all the sex jokes that I totally understood back in the day. Mm, man, yep, yep, man. there were a lot of them. Oh, yep. I re I remember mm. like, I this is real. I remember being in sex ed and everybody was like, like not even everybody wasn't even like into porn like that yet. Like they were like still exploring their own feelings. Like our our balls are barely dropped, right? <laughs> and I remember like the teachers like today we're gonna talk about the difference between sperm and semen. And, uh, and the teacher called us all out. It's like, I know that you think you know what it is, but you don't know what it is. And then I turned to the guy next to me and I, and I was like, hey, do you know what it is? Because I don't know what it is. And he's like, yeah, I think semen is like used sperm. It's just like dirty <laughs> sperm that, that's come out once and you use it again or something like that. I'm like, that is disgusting. Oh, Turned out that that is not true. <laughs> For those of you just joining us, it turns out it's more complicated. Than that. Yeah, it's it's a lot. It's um, a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Okay, I'm dead serious. That is not a story I made up. I remember. And then and then the teacher said the answer like two minutes later. And then I looked at him. And then he looked at me. It's like I didn't know. It's like a credibility moment. just gone. <laughs> gone. Dude. Can't trust this guy. <laughs> this guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, I, where where this where's that girlfriend that's in your wallet that I've never met before? <laughs> She's in Canada. Um, oh, man. Okay. My, uh, like, what do you call it? Like the health, healthful living class. Uh-huh. Did you have a class like that? I have like no covered... idea what the hell that is. I'm okay. like, I'm <laughs> it covers like sex ed, but also like just, you know, life cycle, how to like be healthy throughout your life sort of thing. Um, what? We, we... Wait, hold on. What? Yeah. Like, okay. like well, mental let me, let me just Let me just jump to the story that I'm getting okay, to. Okay, yeah, please. So uh, part of it was you take home a plastic baby and you have to take care of it. Did you do something like that? Uh, no, there was a separate elective like that. I know okay. what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you didn't do it? I did not do that elective. Baby I did choir thing. instead. Okay. It was like a choice, yeah. Yeah. And you took that plastic baby plastic home? Plastic baby. Um, it, would, it would cry and you would have to stick a key in its back and turn it. Oh, that's for, fucked up. For a certain amount of time until it cooed and then you could take the key out. Oh, that is... Yeah. So, <laughs> that, like, like one hold does on, where with a real in the baby. Back, where right? in the back was this keyhole? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine if it was that easy? Um, oh my god! Anyway, so you got you got a whole like range of students reacting to this thing. Like my my friend Steve, who uh, took the baby home, threw it in the closet, threw a bunch of blankets on top of it, and and at the end of the week, just grabbed it took it to school and it had like 40 counts of abuse and neglect or whatever because it right. keeps a little record on the computer inside yeah. and, and two then, cases of drowning yeah yeah <laughs> just just threw it in the closet and left it um <laughs> me i i would like you know stay up and keep the lights on and i would have to wake up and like turn the key and everything you really are a people pleaser well in this case a machine <laughs> pleaser. you're you're a plastic baby 
Please do. I didn't feel any love for the baby, though. People are like, don't you like feel some affection for it, though? It's like, no, it's a piece of plastic that makes noise. It's not an actual baby. But I took it to school and my friend Amy like sees it. And she's like, oh, the baby. And she like j- instantly bonded Aww. with the baby. Yeah. Did I have, I have a story like that. Like, yeah. you know, like, did you have a dog growing up? No, always wanted one. Never oh, had dude, one. I had a dog growing up. And like, I really loved that dog, you know? And sometimes that dog would go in heat and she'd just like hump everything. I'd let her hump my leg, you know? She's like, she's like, she's got a short life. Man. True love. Yeah. She's got a short life. I mean, like, let her enjoy this. Moment. I, you know, I cared for her. I'm like, you hump my leg all you want, girl. And uh, <laughs> like, I'm serious. I mean, uh, I feel like otherwise yeah. is abuse. I mean, <laughs> where is that? No, I'm just kidding. Never heard that argument just before, like, but yeah. Like, yeah, like, enjoy your life. Yeah. I mean, you're going to die before I will to the dog, you know? Like, right. yeah, it wasn't weird or anything. No, of course not. Nothing yeah. weird about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so t- yeah, so it's like just like you care for the baby, I care for my dog. You yeah, know, it's, that, but different needs. Yes, different <laughs> needs. I'll say I'm glad the baby didn't try anything like that. That yeah. would have made it more awkward. Yeah, I I've heard about people abusing that baby. Did you get a good grade? I hope you got a good grade. I have no idea. I was very sleep deprived, so. That sounds about right. Like the actual, how, how much did like it the actual you? newborn phase, there's a, a veil of forgetfulness. Nothing got through that. I don't yeah, so I was going to ask you, you have a, how old is George? Five, six? He's six. Yeah. Six, yeah. Mm-hmm. So did you learn anything from that plastic baby that was applicable to George? Uh, expect to be sleep deprived, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did, that was, I believe that was the main takeaway too, is like that having a baby will be hard. That is what you are to take away from this. It will be hard. You shouldn't do it. Don't you dare get pregnant while in high school. That's the, that's the, the, the thing they want you to come away from the experience with, I believe. Really? Yeah. For real? I don't know about you, but, um, have, this is like kind of do with the key, but was George, like my babies, like Kaname, the oldest, he was at one point like constipated. Like, and we were like really concerned mm, for him. He just yeah. wasn't, he was like infant, like really small. Right. And like he couldn't even crawl or anything. And uh I remember my mom saying, like, oh, if the baby's constipated, you put some Vaseline on a Q tip and you and you stick it up his butt and like roll around and, like it and it worked. And like he it pooped. He pooped. That's kinda like that key in that baby, you know? <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> Have you have you heard of the Windy? Oh no. So the, the Windy is like a I little plastic tube that you, you stick up there and it's meant to like relieve gas when they're in their oh, colic and stuff. Did I need that as an adult? The first thing that you that like happened when we stuck it in, it went pew. <laughs> <laughs> gas, yeah. gas propulsion. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, good times. Good times. The newborn phase. Yeah, dude. Lordy. Yeah, yeah the, the babies, man. Babies. They're, they're pooping machines, man. Mm-hmm. They're pooping machines. I remember one time I was in high school and my dog would poop in my my bedroom and like it real it stunk man it sucked yeah and like i don't want to clean it up so i like avoided my bedroom <laughs> and it got to the point where it got like real hard and crusty didn't stink anymore <laughs> and i just like lived with it for like a month dog because uh, i just really didn't want to pick it up and then <laughs> like a month or two later my mom comes in my room and she like she's like I've been like impressed with the level of aging this this turd had gone through. Yeah, I remember that. I remember when I was like I was like comfortable to step over the turd because it didn't smell anymore. Oh man! <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. That was like the time. That, time is a great thickener of things. Yeah, man. That's like the level patience. of laziness. Yeah, dude. I was you just like, have patience. Lazy. Nature will, will reclaim everything eventually. Did you feel like yeah. uh, uh, when did you start like? Have you always been like really good at emotionally expressing yourself? Am I good at it now? I don't know. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like uh, expressing. Let us say you're expressing your creativity. I mean like uh, you're you're a damn good producer. Thank you. You're, you're a great musician. Thank um, you. Have you always been able to express yourself musically or in other creative outlets? Um. I, I'm the youngest, youngest child. Uh, by the time I came along, my parents were very chill and relaxed about parenting. So I got a whole lot of like, yeah, you know, ex- explore your, your talents, explore your hobbies, like do, do what you want. Um, and so I was given a lot of like encouragement 
to express, to experiment. Wow. Uh, like taking piano lessons. Dude, what does that feel? How does that feel to like good have good parents, dude? <laughs> Feels good. I mean, yeah, uh, it's it's something that that I'm very grateful for is that I I have they just like supported yeah. you even during your bullshit mm-hmm. phase. Like I guarantee, at bear, one point, your parents, mind. your parents like at one point listened to your song was like, wow. That is ass. <laughs> like there had to have been a moment like that, but they got over it and they like supported you through it. That's crazy. Do you I think mean, you could do that with George? No. Do you do you do that with George now? No, no. I tell him like not good enough, son. You need to be for better. real. Wait, hold on, no, hold I'm, on. I'm joking. No, I'm joking. <laughs> oh my God. no yeah. <laughs> no, it's yeah. I I, I want to pass that on. I want to pay it forward. Um, I mean, you seem healthy. Yeah. <laughs> like, in a, like you good. seem it's, like you had good parents. It's working. I'm my my performance is working. Yeah, That's you, good. You don't seem like paranoid or anything. You know, <laughs> I'm trying to think of other like signs of bad parenting. <laughs> <laughs> you seem like really well. Bear in mind, I'm also a people pleaser. So like, uh, oh, okay, yeah. Oh, so actually, your parents were not good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I, I was never that rebellious. So you did was, you never have a rebellious phase? Not really. I got in trouble once. Do you feel like, Do like, you feel jealous of people that had a rebellious face? Uh, is that a good question? I, I don't know. Let me let me let me put it this way: If I hear about a rebellious phase that sounds fun enough, I would probably be envious. Uh, envious but, of the fun. Yeah. You don't ever get envious of like the freedom that that kid had to just do whatever the heck they want, or like have the desire to do whatever the heck they want. Do you feel like your people pleasing is? boxed you in at any point well uh yes definitely but Mm -hmm. probably more as an adult than as a kid really you feel like it's worse now well i just if i had been rebellious as a kid like i wouldn't have done smart things i wouldn't have done like i mean that sounds about right (laughs) (laughs) i mean correct like if you were rebellious as a kid you wouldn't have done smart things that sounds about right i don't know I'm you, out of, you really I'm out of my depth like, here. This is uh <laughs> But you you as an adult feel like you're more people pleaser now? Well, I don't know. It's um yes. Yes, I I guess I am. Like Really? Yeah, like in a in a professional situation, like if I'm talking to my boss or something, then I definitely want to like I treat him kind of like a like a religious <laughs> authority figure rather than just like somebody who I could yell at if I wanted to, you know. That's interesting. I mean, yeah. I guess it's better than the opposite. Treat your, <laughs> treat, your, treat your boss like a scumbag. Treat your boss like a subordinate. Yeah, I think it's better than that. That's interesting because yeah. I was thinking about the opposite. Like, the closer, the older I get, the less I give a fuck, man. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I'm ready to piss some people off, you know? Like, not on purpose, but as an unfortunate byproduct. Well, so you know? I, I, I am envious of that. Like, I wish I felt that way. I wish I... I also wish I felt yeah. that way. And I'm like, I'm really proud of it, actually. Like, for real. Yeah. I remember I did like a podcast interview last week and I said something. And I remember the host said, Oh, we got to edit that out. And there's like a part of me that was really proud that I openly and unashamed like said something that they decided we needed to edit out because it's the most bullshit thing I ever said. <laughs> it's probably a retarded joke about my son. <laughs> and they're like, we need to edit that out. And I was right. like, hell yeah, man. Yeah. Because it did not phase me that that's something inappropriate to say. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm proud I, of that. Yeah. I, I wish I were. I think I'd probably make better music too. If For I, real? Yeah. Here's the deal, dude. Is like, um, I know like if you're listening right now, you should check out Mike's like Mike and I, by the way, We've been working together now, what, a couple years? One year? Yeah, We've done a lot of songs within like the last that, year. Yeah. Um, together, uh, Mike is a phenomenal producer, man, and uh, really talented. And more importantly, I can tell that your music tastes are very similar to my personal <laughs> music tastes. So it's like every time I get your music, it's like it doesn't feel like a job, yeah. man. It's I, a I, big know, blessing. I know your taste of music is good because it's a lot like mine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how you know it's yeah. good, dude. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, with your music, man, I do feel like, I I really feel like you have this blend of cinematic, like you're able to create soundscapes really well. That's very intriguing. And it feels like you have a lot of experience. Like it, mm. it feels thoughtful. Like you're not a beat maker. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like you're definitely, like you know some theory. You know some shit, you know? And uh, it feels like that. And so when I listen to your music, 
there's there's also a level maybe that level of constraint that you feel is good too because if you played or produced music like Jacob Collier just like unaccessible to the normal human I don't think I would enjoy it. See, I'm I'm envious of Jacob Collier. Yeah, <laughs> see, like, you shouldn't be because I, wish I, I was did, just more out there. His like, his you know, newer like, stuff, his newer stuff is better, but yours is like in the box enough where mm. it's very accessible, but technical enough that I know that you know what the fuck you're well, doing. Well, well, that's like the whole my whole current philosophy of music is just that people like a balance of what is familiar, what is accessible, what is, you know, conventional, but also with some surprise thrown in there. Something that's pushing the envelope in some way that, that like is surprising and novel. And so finding the sweet spot is going to depend on the genre and the listener's expectations mm -hmm. and also just how bold and adventurous you feel and how much you are trying to conform to other people. So um, I think... When I was younger, I was better at being creative. As uh, as I as I've gotten older, I've focused more on trying to be more like technically, objectively good at it. And I've probably swung too far in the direction of playing it safe. And so, something that I feel that I should actively work on now is trying to be more adventurous, but like in the right way. So I'm know? curious, like, and I'm I'm figuring out how exactly to word this question. But do you feel like you're playing it safe because you're using less advanced techniques? Or do you feel like you're playing, uh, playing it safe because all of those super advanced layering type things, sound selection type things now come so naturally that it doesn't feel like you're trying as hard? I mean, ideally it would be the latter probably. But I think the, the honest answer is that because I work with other people, I'm trying to bring their vision to life. So so the, the the truth is that most of the time I'm concerned with just making something that the artist is going to feel like represents their sound mm -hmm. rather than me trying to be like, how can I make this a cool, edgy thing? You know, that's usually not on my mind, but sometimes I feel like it ought to be. And maybe that's wrong. Maybe, maybe I don't need to change anything. I don't know. <laughs> well, dude, I, I love your music. Yeah. Like, Thank I'm not you. saying Thank that you. to like brown nose or anything. Like, I could hate you and still love your music. Oh, well. Yeah, I, not that I hate you. Right. Or plan on it anytime soon. <laughs> we'll get there. We're just like an inch away from a massive falling out. It's going to happen. Yeah, dude. Uh, I, um, I did marry an well, Asian woman, a Japanese woman, Yoko Ono, dude. <laughs> Jeez, I do but, uh, no, I, I feel like you make it sound good, honestly. Like, this guy. Dude, you, well, this you, guy make my, you make my God job right easy, here. man. It, yeah. it's, really, it's really great because um, it's, it's, there's been a few songs where you sent me. Well, a few songs reset me where it's like, I'm going to make this guy's day. And then there's been a few songs where it's like, I don't know how I'm going to make this sound better because it sounds great already. Because oh. I, you, I can you do tell, something because like, it, it always sounds better. You so. do a really good job with like thoughtful arranging, which I like, like for any producer out there that's listening right now, I think is one of the most underrated skills because I can tell that you're arranging from like a songwriter perspective, like arranging segments of a song and tell it's like storytelling. You're also arranging from like a mixing point of view. Mm. Like you're arranging like frequencies of instruments. You're not layering too many low mid range instruments. You know, you, you yeah. think I can tell that you, there's a little subconscious, whether it's on purpose or not, that you're thinking about the layering of the frequencies. Yeah. I forget who kind of put this in my head that the idea of like trying to make something thick or full by layering a bunch of versions of the same thing isn't the way to do it. Oh, for sure. And rather it's to like fill every part of the frequency spectrum. So That's happened so many times where like yeah. a hip hop uh, producer will send me a track to mix and I'll like, they have like seven kicks and then I mix it for them. They're like, how'd you get the kick to hit so damn hard? And I, I muted like, six of them. Yeah, I muted six of them. I, was like, uh, I moved yeah. six of them. And then I didn't even use that first one. What I did is I used trigger and, <laughs> and sampled a different kick. Cause yeah. dude, can we just talk a little bit about the, the stock, the, the built in standard stock <laughs> kick drum samples from logic, bro. Oh. They suck. <laughs> Like mm -hmm. if I bounced a beach ball on my hardwood floor, that would sound better <laughs> than the kick drums that come stock with Logic, bro. They are horrible. They're so bad. I wouldn't know. I haven't used Logic. Let's, let's in a listen minute. to them and judge so. them together sometime. Like, no, as, as like a, you know, good. like a guy's night out. This, <laughs> like, just like, what do you go, What do you do for fun? I rate kicks. Yeah. <laughs> I just listen to a bunch of kicks and I'm like, yeah, it's a solid five right there. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, that's yeah, dude. I had a one of my good friends, Caden. Man, he produces his own music, and he's really talented. I brought him out from Utah. He lives out here now, and he's rooming with uh, some of our interns at In the Mix. That's at my studio, and uh, bro, he, 
I, I used to ra- gra- rail him, man, because he was—he's not like a producer, but he makes his own beats. He's good enough to songwrite, and his sound selection used to be so ass. And it just started with every single session was just like the Logic kick drum. Like at one mm. point, I almost—I think I like gave him a pack of like kick drums, <laughs> like from Splice. It's like, Here, please use um, this. Somebody should comment, and if you know of a like a, a like hit massive hit song that uses the Logic stock kicks, I'd be curious if that's a thing. If no, well, here's mm. the thing: like some of those some of those kick drum samples that he used, instead of replacing it, triggering it, or something like that. I just really EQ'd the shit out of them and mm. like compressed and destroyed the shit out of them where like I made it sound good, but like I had to like filter out 80% of the frequencies <laughs> and reintroduce through saturation another 20%. Mm. <laughs> I like it was kind yeah. of making it thump a little bit. Yeah, yeah. it was suck. But uh, your sound selection is always great. Your arrangement is always great. Thank um, you. What is, tell me about like uh, your process as far as like what you listen to a song and you're like traditional producer. Like a lot of your clients have a song written, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. Yep. They have a song written on Probably piano more or guitar. often than not. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So people don't rap on your beats that you've already made. Like no. you're like more traditional in that sense. Yeah. Like very. Very old school. Very musical. Mm. Music school. Like very like that. Yeah. The Very skillful. That's much more skillful to do that. Um, and uh, I do think, not that hip hop doesn't take skill. Right. Um, but it's a different different skill. Sorry, let me let me rephrase that. Um, but I do think that it's very interesting. It's very unique, especially nowadays. Um, I I, what's that process like, man? When you receive a song someone's written, I assume you sit down with them and ask them what you want, what they want. Yeah, we start with a, we start with a playlist, and I basically just try to identify like, um, so let's say it's you. Let's say you're an artist mm-hmm. and you have a song. Mm-hmm. I want to know what it sounds like in your head mm-hmm. when you. Like, it sounds bad in my head, though. <laughs> That's why I'm hiring you. <laughs> well, no, because like I, I'm the longer I hold on this, it's like my self confidence goes down. <laughs> you need to save me, dog. <laughs> but, okay, but like if I'm writing a song, chances are in my head, like I've been listening to something that informs where this song comes mm-hmm. from. Not just in terms of the top line, but also in terms of the kind of instruments and the kind of intensity and the kind of arc and groove it's going to have to it. Right? So, like, realistically, I'd probably be like, okay, very inspired by, like, Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder. Modern times would be, like, Lewis Cole mm-hmm. and Wolfpack. Very inspired yeah. by, like, that modern soul and, and like, Earth, Wind & Fire kind yeah. of sound. Okay, so if, so I, so if, I'm, not, if I'm not familiar with those songs that you've been, that you've been digging... Which I know you been... are because we have great, you right. have great taste. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um... So I'm going to spend some time getting familiar with that stuff and trying to identify like how, because some artists are really uh, like, can the, I like the drums in this song, but I like the guitars in this song and I like the vocals in this song. And that's like really helpful for me that at that point, it just kind of produces itself because they know what they want. Um, Or they might just be like, I kind of like the vibe of these five songs. And then I have to use you know, my judgment of like, oh, okay, let me... What what about it do they like? Yeah, exactly. So it's it's a bit of like... Um, how far... Can I, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but how far yeah. into the production do you go by yourself before checking in with them? Being like, is this the right direction? Do you like, do you finish it and then ask them? I do I do a version one, yeah. And you're just like, Full hey, this one. is my idea. I was going to add more to it, but mm-hmm. like... Lately, people haven't been wanting a lot of changes. So that's good. Which is interesting because yeah. one, you're a little bit more expensive than you used to be. Mm-hmm. Your clients, which typically are peers similar in age, are now older and have more funding and have also have more respect for people that are talented. Like, dude, I feel like I was so dispre- disrespected when I was like, granted, I didn't deserve any respect when I was like 24 mixing <laughs> records, you know? <laughs> no, that, not that my shit was ass, but like I just started, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's because I moved to LA. It's like, oh, he- There is a stigma about that. He's in LA. He- he knows what he, dude, he knows what he's doing. There is a dude, yeah. yeah. My work went up because people like my PR changed. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I'd like to think I'm getting better, like legitimately, but yeah. Well, I don't no. know if how much you how good you were before, <laughs> to be honest. I know like yeah. we we yeah. always had like slightly because uh, we both used to live in Utah mm-hmm. for a while, and then we got the heck out of there. Cause have you ever thought about like how weird it was to like living in Utah? Like not not like like How long how long did you live in Utah? Are you from Utah? No. Okay, okay. I lived in Utah just for college for like four years, four okay. or five years. I, I lived there for like 13 years. So, so like now that you're out of Utah, again, mm-hmm. like objectively, 
isn't Utah a weird place to live? Like, <laughs> like I feel like Rhode Island is less of a weird place. Like, if someone, if I wasn't, if I didn't live in Utah and someone said, like, yeah, I lived in Utah, I'd be like, what the fuck is Utah? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Well, what's funny is that I actually, like, still have a lot of, like, like really positive feelings about oh, Utah. Oh, me too, Especially, actually. like, the music scene. Oh, I, I often, so good. Often when I tell people that I lived in Utah, I find myself inadvertently like trying to explain why utah is so cool and like why the why the music I do the scene same is so thing, cool dude. and people are just like okay no but it's just like so <laughs> random you know yeah, it's like, like no you this is like where imagine dragons came from and neon trees came from yeah, like yeah, joshua yeah. james they're like all right cool <laughs> no no it's, it's just like it's not that utah is like bad yeah. or has a bad reputation it's just like so random you it's, know like it's very different from here you haven't very watched different. wayne's world no oh dude I, you're in for a treat there's a I scene think. where they like they're, they're, they're green screening. They're green screening, and they're like, they're like, oh, look at us transport, <clears throat> and they're like, we're in Hawaii, a hukuakahiki, you know, like they're kind of like, oh, awesome, we're in Texas, howdy, brothers, we're for barbecue, and then they're like, they like, or be magically whisked away to Delaware, and they just stand there and they're like. Hi, I'm in <laughs> Delaware. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's kind of what Utah feels like. It's like, hi. I'm in Utah. Utah. It's like it's let's really go, random. Let's go skiing is what but, most dude, people I think know. it's like the stereotype yeah. of like Mormons growing up playing piano. There's something musical about Mormons, dude. There's something musical about yeah. Mormons. Even though they got the most boring ass music in church. In any church that you could ever go to. I'm pretty sure Lutherans have better music than us, dog. Like, <laughs> than the Mormons in Utah. But, but there's yeah. something about it. There's something about it that like there's talent out there. Like I came out here and was slightly disappointed. Mm. Like the cream of the crop out here is better than Utah. But the average, the average in Utah is significantly higher than the average musician out here. I remember you telling me that like the do first you, time we that? hung out. Like when I moved out here. Did you feel like that holds true to this day? Um, well. Or maybe I just have suck at I, finding good music. Well, that's the thing. It's like <laughs> um, the LA music scene, from what I can tell from my very vast experience with it, is that it's like a million little scenes, right? Mm. And I feel like I am, because of where I teach, I know a few people in one scene. And because of working with you, I know a few people in another scene. But there's like an entire ocean of music scene out there so i don't know yeah I don't, no I don't this really is know. this yeah. is turning into me recognizing i need better <laughs> friends i think that's what it is <laughs> no no yeah. i know a lot of talented people out here so i think like i do in my perspective it feels like very subjective that like the people that are good out here are really good they're really good. Like the people that are like the, the guitar player that's on tour all the time, the keyboard player that's on tour all the time, like the studio keyboard player that's like known for being booked for studio sessions. Freaking phenomenal, dude. But like the average singer songwriter that like never releases music, that's just like plays at open mic nights in Utah is way underrated, I feel mm. like. Yeah. Like I the average, like they haven't yeah. even released any music. They just write songs for fun. They're really underrated mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. But, you know, even the, like the rappers that think they're the only rapper from Utah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like they were really yeah. talented. Oh, I know him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it was yeah. cool, man. It was. I had a really good time All in Utah. Them. Yeah, I had a really good time in Utah. It was a really weird time, dude. I I did a uh, nude modeling. It's like one of my first jobs in Utah in BYU. What? But it was oh, like, okay, all right. It was at BYU. Figure drawing. Yeah, figure drawing. Okay. Uh, and it was really weird because it's like a private, that. really private Christian college, right? So it's like I went in and they're like, "I need some money," and she like this lady came. Wait, they pay like, you for that? Yeah, they pay they pay me like good, like minimum oh. wage is like eight bucks at the time. I was gonna pay like fifteen bucks. Okay, it's like when I first moved out there, and because it's a private Christian school, they had me wear a speedo, right? Which like almost makes That's it not, a little bit more not, uncomfortable. It's not I don't weird, know, because <laughs> then you just got like, because like I don't know, like if you're free balling. It's like, I don't have to shave. It's just like natural, you know? But if I just got a few hairs sticking out the side, you know, you got, you got to like, you got to, you got to shave, dog. And like these figure drawers, they told me like, if you got a hairy chest, it's hard to, to draw shadows, apparently. And I got, I don't know what it is, but like, I'm not Asian enough, genetically speaking. I got a hairy like, chest, dog. I'm new game plus. Yes. I am, I am hard mode. <laughs> 
not what you say when your new model, is it? Yeah, yeah. I was about to say my mom phone, dog. Uh, but uh, uh, no, dude, they yeah. had me wear a suit. I, I remember being interviewed for the position. It's like, again, really conservative, private Christian college. She's the lady that was like interviewing me. She's like, just to let you know, the general authorities of the church have okayed this position. And she's like coaxing me into this, telling me that it's okay. You're like, good, I was you worried. You don't have to be embarrassed. Yeah. You know, the leaders of the church have said that this is okay. You're really doing a good thing. If you ever are embarrassed, like, you can always step out or let me know. And it was just like, the fact that she cared so much made me uncomfortable. If she's like, hey, thanks for whoring yourself out for 15 bucks an hour, I'd have been more comfortable. <laughs> like, I would have been like, hell yeah, let's do this thing. And it was crazy because, like, all of the other, like, like men and women, like, you can tell that they, they were like, like, uh, what is it called? Like exhibitionists? Like they were just like <laughs> something was not right with them. Like they were like one step away from like streaking in the mall, and this is like their way of letting it out. Like it was really cool. Also, that would have been really fun to date. Like those girls. I was married at the time, so I definitely didn't think that. But if I did think about that, that would have been a great place to pick up girlfriends for dates. Is like the nude. Mo- anyway, we're getting <laughs> really weird, to engineer. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> really weird time, really weird yeah. time, yeah. So, nude modeling, man. nude modeling, <laughs> nude modeling, dude. Yeah. yeah, I remember when I started growing. Do you remember when you do you have chest hair? Well, I'll, here, let me show you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, a little bit, a little bit. I'm not, I'm not a walking carpet. I'm not a no, no, I'm not. I'm not, dude. I'm not, I'm not from Jordan, not, dude. Not Alec, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not I'm Alec Baldwin, East, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, yeah, dude. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm pretty hairy, especially for an Asian. It didn't kick in until I was like 20. I remember looking down at the mirror one day and being like, what the fuck happened? A little Spider-Man I rem- moment. I remember, yeah, yeah. no, like, yeah, a yeah. Spider-Man moment. That's good. It's just like waking up one day. Yeah, that's wild. Okay. Uh, anyway. Um, I need to repark the car. You need so to repark the car. So let's, let's, uh, we're getting into big tangents. <laughs> My uh, pause how, just- so anyway, uh, pause real quick. See I don't have any leverage on you right now, but my goal is to to build leverage on you, to make sure that you have such a good time that you don't want to leave and you feel guilted into staying. Like, that's a great situation as a studio, you know? Totally. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm offering you so much value that you feel like you're missing out if you left. One kid did. He moved to, uh, to Georgia, to Atlanta, to continue with, like, the trap hip-hop scene. Called me a week later. Like, uh, no, no, a month later. He gave me some time. Like, a month or two later. And he's like, dude, I need to come back. Would you accept me? Like, you can tell that he was like scared to ask, afraid to ask. He, you can tell in his voice that he like you, he like dro- he felt like he dropped the ball. You know, it's like, damn, I didn't realize how good I had at ITM, had in the mix, and that's how you know we have a great internship program. Yeah, man. uh, your your student, uh, older student, uh, former student, Victoria. Yeah, uh, the Brazilian girl. Uh-huh. Yeah, she's gonna start working with us starting this Wednesday, t- starting tomorrow. Really? Yeah. Oh, she didn't that. tell you that? She no. reached out to us? She didn't tell me that. Oh. Yeah, is she cool? I mean, obviously, she was hanging out with you. Yeah, she's cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm happy for her. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll get... Is she graduated? Uh, I don't remember if she was doing, like, the full certificate program over there or if she was just taking a few classes. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. you can ask her when you see her. Yeah. So uh, this is I'm gonna be I'm gonna ask a sort of uncomfortable question, but I think this is important to bring up. Um, music teachers, especially in music production, get a bad rap. Like trying to teach they in do. an industry, trying you know they I mean do. like the idea of like trying told to, me that <laughs> like trying to teach in a in a super fast evolving industry, and most of the time when you're tenured and full time, you don't have time to participate fully in. Um, the music scene locally or wherever, right? Hmm. You're in a very peculiar instance where you're doing like the satellite for UCLA, from what I understand, or you did that, or you're, I don't know if you're still doing that. And you're also doing part-time at Icon, where Icon values only hiring people that are currently active in the music scene. What's it like teaching with current um, up-to-date, like being up-to-date? Well, I mean, that was always the plan. When I when I knew I wanted to teach, I wanted to be not teaching full-time, but teaching and still working in the field so that I could, you know, not become stagnant like that, but also so that I could have um, real-world ongoing experience to back up what I'm teaching the students so that I'm, like, not just um, an example of what happened before, but it's like, this is what you can do now. So that's what I'm trying to be for them. 
I mean, and, does it feel uh, like does it feel like since you're actively working and actively sharpening your axe at the time, right? At, while you're teaching, do you feel like it's difficult to teach the principles that that are so automatic? Because you're not like you haven't been teaching for 15 years. You've been no, doing yeah. for 15 years. Does it feel weird to transition into teaching what? You know, like teaching as a skill. Uh, yes, teaching as a skill is very different from. <laughs> How do you feel about from it? music production? Uh, it's challenging. I like that it's challenging. I I feel like I, it's an opportunity to to learn stuff and get better at things. But it's it's very important to me because you know I owe a lot to the people who were my teachers throughout my life, and I feel that it's important to be in a, a teacher student cycle. And uh, yeah, so I'm still like a learner of things, but I want to also pass on encouragement and knowledge so i know that you're a learner of all things and i know that you love movies we've talked about color mm -hmm. theory as well you're oh, yeah. a big storytelling guy yeah um tell me what are some ways that you learn um and advance your techniques nowadays um youtube Shout out to YouTube. YouTube's good. Any specific channels or is there specific for, things that you type like and search? like music production or, or cinema or... Music. Let's keep it music. Okay. Yeah. Music. Well, that's another nice thing about teaching is that showing up at a school that has a curriculum, I need to learn that curriculum and not just teach like what I know because what I know probably is a little bit out of date or incomplete or, you know, short-sighted. So... Learning someone else's curriculum is like a w another way to level up. I've learned a ton since starting to teach at Icon. And, and I assume and like the students keep you up to date too. Like they they're young. Oh yeah. They're vibrant. You know they yeah. they they haven't they have. Oh yeah. <laughs> they like, haven't kind of been depressed yet. You know. Well, you know, I'll have students that know about like this really uh, cool plugin that I've never heard of. You know that like nobody's heard of, but this student knows about it. So it's like, oh yeah, that's rad. Thanks for showing me that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Has. No, nah, I'm not going to ask you that question. But yes, they are all depressed. Are they, already, they're, like. There's obviously standout students, right? Um, yeah. Have you... Um, now, there's always been that friend that in, in any situation that's super talented, but when they're unable to pull their weight. How do you... What, as a teacher and as an active worker in the industry, what do you believe is the ratio between skill or talent and discipline or hard work? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> How would you weight those two? Um, I would rate discipline above talent. 60-40? 75-25. Really? Yeah. Can you explain that? I just, you know, the most talented person in the world, if they don't have the discipline to learn, to show up, to work when they don't feel like working, they're not going to be doing this for much longer. At least not not in a professional shoot the moon, go the distance sort of way. So yeah, discipline's huge. How would you feel if, if a student right now, I get a lot of DMs about students wanting to go into music production. Mm -hmm. What is your number one advice from the teacher's perspective uh, for students going into music production school to get the most out of their school? Um, collaborate. Collaborate with yeah. other students? With other students, yeah. Because I am still, you know, what, like... I'm like making 10, money from my 10, classmates. 10, yeah. 11, 12 years out of college now, I am still working with people that I met in college. Me too. And yeah. Yeah. There is, it's a unique thing. It's a unique thing to be thrust into this scene where, like, normally outside of college, you have to do a ton of work to go out and network and meet people. In college or at a school, like, you are just thrust into this tiny space with these other people and maybe you like them, maybe you don't like them, but you've got to rub elbows with them and you have to learn to work with them. And that's huge. Yeah. You're going to learn a ton from that. And if you take advantage of like making things together, if they go the distance and you go the distance, you'll still be working together like 10, 20 years down the road. Do you feel like there's any school assets or programs that students typically don't take advantage of that they should? Well, like access to the yeah. recording studio. Do you feel like students actually use the recording studio enough? I mean, it depends on it depends on the school, right? Like, because there are there are places people go to learn to record and to use microphones and preamps and everything, and there are places people go to 
you know, learn how to make wubs in in Ableton. And and Icon has a reputation as being a for, place for a wubby school for for making the wubs, you know. But um, but it's so much more than that. It's a very comprehensive, yeah, uh, holistic sort of approach to production. And so I think that's like part of my job teaching studio techniques at Icon is that is trying, maybe not trying to convince people, but but helping people to see the value in, you know. Like, yeah, you want to be playing festivals as a DJ, but you might be making money in a few years by being a recording engineer. So it's good to know how to do it and it'll be helpful to you. And uh, whereas somebody who's like, I don't know, primarily an engineer, it's like it might be good for you to take a, a songwriting class and, and learn how more about the creative process and the creative side of things. You can empathize more with artists you work with. So I, I just think I think being as holistic as possible in everything is good. Oh, of course. Yeah. Keeping it as natural as possible. Yeah. And just, and just like expanding, like, uh, any, any artist that wants to learn like filmmaking, mm -hmm. that's huge because we are, we all have to be filmmakers now because of social media to make them, get them to make films instead of studying how to make films. Yeah. 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 So it's a very holistic. So approach. like, yeah, learn, learn everything, learn graphic design, learn, you know, visual art, learn acting, it's all important in today's day and age. Um, I want to ask you, of all the things that you've been through, life events, uh, getting married, going through school. I did that. I did that too. Yeah. Having, a ch having a child, moving that. to LA. Did that, yeah. Was there ever a point in your life where, like, this was a time in my life where I accelerated the most? Hmm. Uh, since moving to LA has been that way. Since starting teaching has been that way. Uh, doing my master's degree in England was that way as well. That's right. Yeah. I forgot that you did graduate school in England. Mm -hmm. How's the food out there? Is it as shit as I've heard it is? No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. No. Okay. So, so England gets a bad rap because the food isn't salty. Wait, really? Yeah, out here we Americans like we're we're just like throwing tons of salt in our food oh, to make yeah, it taste better. Oh yeah, because it's amazing, dude. I'm like a deer. Yeah, I'm licking, I'm so, licking that, <laughs> licking that salt block, bro. So if you go to a place where they don't throw in as much salt, your your tongue just has to like reacclimate to like tasting actual flavors, and that's that's British food. So do they just food like has flavor? You just need when you go, just throw some salt on your food until you don't need it anymore. So you're and telling me good. like these yeah. these these cats in Britain, these athletes in Britain, they're just like cramping up all the time because they don't have enough <laughs> sodium in their body. <laughs> they're just like, oh, god damn. I mean, they're also known for fish and chips, right? So that's, uh, okay, that's where okay, the sodium got comes okay. in. They got yeah. they got uh you know, I was talking to uh, you know, there's there's times, man, where you want some like really nasty deep fried fish and chips or like you know panda. Panda bro, like there's times, you know what I'm talking about where like you're really craving like a digestive oil change, you know, yeah. like you just need some shitty deep fried I'm, meat. I'm going to feel terrible six yeah. hours later. Yeah. You clear the system. Here's, here's the other thing about there's England time, though. Bro. Um, time, England yeah. is full of immigrants, same as America. And um, so there is food from like all over the, the other hemisphere. So if you want to get like oh, really, that's really good, like... Um, Indian food's a lot more popular out there. Yeah, yeah. Indian food, mm. uh, Pakistani. Oh, uh, like, yeah. Get Lebanese. Halal, bro. Just, yeah. Mm. All over the place. So there's all kinds of good food in England. Yeah. Asians. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Really? You know where there's a lot of Asians? I hear. Where? Canada, dog. Oh yeah. I hear Canada has a lot of Asians, which makes me wonder if that's why Canada is known to have great food. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> dude, dude. dude i don't know these yeah. asian foods dog so good i'm yeah. very biased that is the most biased thing i could have ever said <laughs> like i think there's very few things that i could have had bias about <laughs> you know more bias about dude rice man does rice pipe you up i mean hold on let me see if you phrase that does <laughs> does rice make you constipated <laughs> okay here's the thing i'm getting older I'm in my thirties now. I can't eat the same way as I as I used to, so um, I try to have brown rice now whenever possible. Yo, that's disgusting, right? 
<laughs> Brown rice. Whole wheat bread. You just eat some unhusked rice, bro. Like just straight, <laughs> just miss skipping a no, process. Yeah, no, white, I'm teasing. I white, know what you, I know. Brown yeah. rice is. We eat brown rice sometimes too. It's yeah, we feed you. it to the dogs it's actually because that's not meant for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> that is not true. That is factually incorrect. Nah, nah. You'll brown be rice thanking is great. me. You'll be thanking me. Brown when rice you're in your is 30s. great. Yeah. Do you find that brown rice clogs you up less? Mm-hmm. It's full of fiber. Yeah. Dude, I, I do not have an issue with pooping. And I don't know. Good if, for you. I do, <laughs> <laughs> my issue is the other way, dude. I'm like concerned, bro. I'm like, this is my fifth solid poop today. Like, I'm not. Oh, man. There's it's not what I thought we'd be talking yeah, about. Yeah, dude. Today. This it's is great. Good, there's man. a, there's a, it's interesting. Japanese, man. There's, there's a bunch of different words for poop. And each one has like a different connotation. My favorite one, it's like childish and like playful. Unchi. U N C H I. It's like a playful word for poop. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good word to know, man. Yeah. So anybody listening right now, you want to impress your Japanese <laughs> friend, break some ice, dude. Just like, hey, heard you taking an unchi. You know, like they're like, ah, I get that. Yeah, that was, it's like it's it's in fact it's so playful. Like the connotation around it is just so playful that it's kind of like the cute way of saying poop. I know that right. sounds weird, but there's like a cute way. Like it's the cutest way to say poop. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> they can be. You asked about uh, if there was a time in my life when I felt that I uh, had sort of an accelerated amount of learning or leveling up. Anyways, yeah, master's degree uh, was very cool. But here's the thing about doing a master's degree overseas. <laughs> that was the craziest set of back, t- craziest set of <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Master's degree in England. How many years? How many uh, years? It's just one. Um, but... Uh, I met a, a lot of really cool people and then promptly left the country and came back here. So I feel like there are people there that I really would have loved to, you know, d- uh, develop deeper relationships with mm-hmm. and make more music with. Who are your peers? Were they producers, composers, um, songwriters? I was, I was in a music production program. So they were all... Modern yeah, productions. Modern pop music. Yeah. Yeah. They That's were, very specific. Mm-hmm. We all had, we had a, like everybody in that program had a look. And you went to we all wore you went to England to study. Hair. You went to England yeah. to study modern pop productions. Yeah, that sounds like a hell of an adventure, dude. It was cool. That's where we had our baby there, and uh, George. Yeah, dude, he's cool. He's I like cool. George. Yeah, he's awesome. And um, yeah, so if you if you do your master's degrees overseas, maybe maybe think about like staying because I kind of yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Are you insinuating that you wish you kind of stayed to a certain degree? Uh, kind of, yeah. Well, just just because, like, I, I was developing, you know, a, a group of collaborators and then promptly just, like, left and came back to my old group of collaborators. So, you know, you just got to you gotta mm. plant roots wherever you are and just make friends. But it would have been, been cool to see what life would have been like had I continued working with the people that I met over there. Because it's just, yeah, it's just hard to stay connected overseas, I found. Yeah, especially because, dude, have you ever tried to have a business meeting with like anybody in Germany? That shit is impossible. <laughs> that shit is in. Impo- yeah. Oh man. Yeah, the time difference is a real thing. Yeah. Now, it's not just that. It is like their nine to five is our one to eight, dude. Yeah. It's like the most worst time difference ever. Mm-hmm. There's no hour in the day where the business hours can like meet. Oh man, that sucks. Yep. Anyway, talking about that, we're talking to a company in Germany right now <laughs> about sponsoring the podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, the that, communication yeah. is very tough. Anyway, uh, how far? How many time zones away is England from Germany? Um, it was seven hours from Utah. I don't know. That sounds like about G- right. Germany's just a couple more, not directly south. So it's yeah, it's probably a couple more. Did sure. you ever visit the other uh, yeah, European? Yeah, I, w- I went to countries? Germany, and Germany has amazing food. And uh, beautiful. Do you sounds. drink? No. So you have no idea if they got good beer. Well, I well, uh, I, I know what people tell me. People tell me that the beer in Germany is amazing. So I'm sure it is. Yeah, that's like all I know. I know and sausages. Bread. I know the bread and meat in Germany is amazing. Meat. Yeah. Man, that's wild to be known as a country for like meat and bread. Yeah. It's but true, I've also though. been to Scandinavia. Scandinavia's got you know good food as well. Good sausage. Good fish. Good gummy candy. Did you go to Finland? Mm-hmm. I, I want to go to Finland. You went to Finland for mm-hmm. real? Yeah. How was that, dude? Uh, Suomi. People are really nice. I bet. Yeah. Did you do a sauna? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then jump yep. in the snow. Didn't jump in the snow, but I took a cold shower. Did you whip each other with branches in the sauna? No. I hear that's my. I had, I had, a, I had a roommate <laughs> Didn't that was get that finished. Far. No. I had a roommate that was finished, bro. And uh, first off, Moomin. Do you know what Moomin is? Like the hippo looking thing? They're not hippos. It's own thing. They're they're their own thing, dog. He would give me crap about it all the time. Anyway, it's an animation cartoon. Oh, okay. No, there. no, anyway, don't know that. Uh, yeah, so apparently in the sauna um, that everybody has in their house, apparently, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. You like they have these special branches that you whip your own back or whip your friends' oh, backs thing. with, yeah. and then you eat sausages while in the sauna with men, and then you jump in the snow and then go back in the sauna. He I made will, it sound amazing. Actually. I will say, getting out of the sauna and like sitting in front of this nice like wood stove fireplace and eating sausage, just like felt warmth through my entire body, like head to toe. Bro, that I've probably warmed your soul or since. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, I bet. Mm-hmm. I bet. Did you go in the winter? No, it was the springtime. Oh, so basically they're winter. <laughs> they're just gonna have they they, well, they have no. they have okay. three days of summer and winter. That's all. Like, <laughs> it was like late spring. Sun went down at eleven p.m. For real? Oh yeah, yeah dude. I t- mm-hmm. my buddy told me that there was a couple days every year where like that there was twenty four hours of just yep. yeah. So uh, we were pretty far north, but not like yeah. I didn't get midnight sun, but yeah. That's crazy. That's, cool. That's a beautiful That's cool. place. I really do mm-hmm. want to visit Finland. Yeah, you should go. Yeah, I have a, Norway, co- I have a couple Sweden, buddies Finland, out there, actually. There. The people that make Amphion are from Finland. Mm. I think. Now I'm really psyching my guessing myself. Do you know Amphion, the speaker company? I've oh, heard of it. Oh, man. Yeah. Now I'm really psyching guessing myself. I'm pretty sure they're from Finland. <laughs> Um, dude, yeah, there's yeah. Finland seems like a uh, cool place in Europe I want to go. Dude, I went to Fr- I never thought I'd ever go to Europe. I never oh, thought right, I you did the thing in France, yeah. Yeah, dude. Europe is crazy. Like, you're walking on history. There's, mm-hmm. like, streets out there that's just, like, that we don't have that same experience in, in America. No. Like, it's just cobblestone, bro. You cannot walk straight, and it's just like, damn. Oh, yeah. Went to Rome, too. Everybody should go to Rome. Really? Rome is amazing. Rome. Yeah. What's up? What's going on in Rome? Well, you know, uh, in England, it would be like, you're walking down the street, and you look over there, oh, that's a cool church. What is it? Like, 1300s, 1400s, it's several centuries old. Rome, you have that same experience, but then you walk a few more steps and you look down and there's like an excavation of 2,000-year-old Roman ruins. Damn. So, and that's everywhere. I mean, I'm just and, imagining like looking at these churches in England and be like, damn, people really paid to get to heaven here. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like back in the day. <laughs> Same yeah. thing like in Rome, you're like, damn, people really like got fed to lions, bro. Like that's a yeah, wild yeah. thing to Coliseum? do. Coliseum? Coliseum is crazy. That's a wild thing. And just, yeah, How was the pizza out there? Amazing. Yeah? Yeah. yeah the do they really, really do this in Italy? Like the, the finger clasp? I'm like, I don't recall seeing that, but. Did they got good coffee out there? Did you drink coffee at that this time? Before my coffee drinking days. Yeah. yeah. Um, but how were the people yeah. out there? Uh, in Rome, I was just touristing, so I didn't really meet a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Airbnb's host was nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you know, like, there's you know, I I I have a I don't I don't really have an image of Italy. Mm. I don't really like. I know a lot of Italians. They're really kind. They're family oriented. That's like my only image of Italy. Oh, a pasta. <laughs> yeah, I don't eat a lot of pasta. Do you eat pasta? Do you um, make pasta at home? Yeah, sparingly. Sparingly. Again, I'm in my 30s, so can't do too much pasta. Damn. <laughs> tell me, tell me, um, yeah. what what precautions now? No, no, no. Let me uh let me rephrase this. What things do you have to pay attention to now that you didn't have to pay attention to in your early 20s to anticipate and prepare for a creative atmosphere? A creative atmosphere? Uh, I think that uh, I just have to make do with the creative atmosphere that I get, you know, as... um, as You just just like hustle through it. As a family man, there's a lot of chaos at home. So uh, just... It's you gotta, don't know exercises, no routines. Do. I mean, what? What am boundaries? I, what am I going to do? I'm going to I'm going to meditate. <laughs> do you? I'm serious. I should. Do you? I should. I'd like to, but so, I just yeah. It's just uh, you're just like naturally thoughtful like this. Having <laughs> am, I, am I? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, like just, just having having kids, having young children just makes life more complicated and makes it so. If you have a home studio, you just have to. 
I mean, you see, be flexible, being flexible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah. have to be more flexible. Like, do you know that you only have this many hours in a day to be creative? So you save that energy for when the session's coming or to anticipate something? Is there anything like that? Um, creativity, I, don't, I honestly don't think about it much. Honestly. Do you, like, do you ever struggle with imposter syndrome? All the time. Even now, especially when I moved here and I started teaching, and like because all, all the other instructors oh. have these like amazing credits of like, oh yeah, I work with uh, Alicia Keys, I work with you know P Diddy or whatever, and and it's like, oh, I, I don't work with anybody who's you know that famous, and but um, I've kind of I'm getting over that. I'm getting more comfortable just being like, no, we're all, you know, we all have something to offer, we all have something to learn, and we all have you know people that we want that we respect and want to learn from. So we're all kind of the same in that way. And dude, I'm I'm coming back to this, but like, I really, really love your work. And for anybody listening right now, um, don't, yeah, you accept that, that compliment, bro. (laughs) Don't, don't start feeling like you don't deserve this because you, you really do deserve your work is phenomenal. I cannot speak highly enough of you. I can tell that it's not just talent, but it really comes from a place of dedication, bro. Like you cannot get to your level without serious hours and and uh, without deep contemplation. Like I can tell your your productions are very thoughtful. Um, and dude, I think anybody that's wanting to get into producing, getting into songwriting, um, wanting to find clients that way, I think there's uh, a note that could be taken out of your book. You know, going through your playlist. Do you have a website? Like, do you have your uh, your works posted on your social media? Yeah, I got I got the link tree. It's you get the it's, link tree. Uh, the poor man's website. I got the link tree on my Instagram. What's your What's your tag? Mike yeah, McClellan. Mike McClellan Music. M C C M C C M C C double C L E double L A N. Yeah. Not to be confused with the and, Australian Mike McClellan who you, who was a singer songwriter who had like some hits in in the eighties and nineties and oh for real. If I ever get famous enough, his legal team is probably coming for me. Do you look like him? No, no, I don't, maybe a little bit. I don't know. He's a lot older than I am. Maybe I'll look like him when I'm older. I hope so. You're, He's a you, handsome man. Oh, he is a handsome man. Yeah, I think so. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I, I guess I don't know if it'd be that much of a downer if I found out there's another dude named DK and he's just ugly as balls. You know, like I don't, I don't know if I, I think that, like, I don't know if that'd be like a da- like a bad thing. I don't know. Or would you be like, oh, good, I'm the handsome one? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think that's what I would think. Like, damn, I got blessed, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. uh, uh, no, dude, yeah. check out your portfolio. I have, and- I have a Spotify playlist where I, I put the stuff that uh, I I feel represents me well. Also, the recent stuff. Um, yeah, so please go listen to all of it. Uh, I really am fond of the people that I've worked with, and I, I appreciate people streaming their music too. And I and I love your if you you need to check out Mike McClellan music at Mike McClellan music on Instagram because he you actually break down your productions um, for many of your songs. Um, been trying to do that. You've been trying. Yeah. I can tell. Mm-hmm. And the last one was actually like humorous. Like I, you, I was engaged the <laughs> entire time. Up. You got this fucking bit. ADHD kid to be engaged the entire instructional video of how that's, you broke down good. the song, that's dude. Good. Yeah. I think that's a feat, man. I can barely get through some of these TikToks. It's like ten seconds. Fuck that shit. I need eight second TikToks. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I, I watched your whole four and a half minute video or whatever yeah. it was. It was oh, great. Great, thank you. I yeah. particularly loved your guitar riffing and how you broke down your guitar. Oh yeah, that's something to anticipate if you're listening right now. <laughs> something. Um, bro, yeah. Uh, drum go boom. What was it? Big drum go boom. Big drum go boom. Yeah, that's the secret to production right there. Big drum go boom. So tell me, uh, Mike, uh, anybody that's studying production right now, I feel like it's a very chaotic world. It's hard to figure mm. out what that you what to learn, how to practice, how to become better. What are the two main things that everybody should be focused on for the purpose of improvement? Okay, well... It's a big question. It's a big question. And but there's I, a big silence I'm willing to follow up with to make you think about it. Okay. Well, we'll just let's just sit and think for a minute. I hate when people ask questions, dog, <laughs> and they don't allow the question to breathe. They like re-explain the question many times. So let me do that. So if I were to rephrase, no, just kidding. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. But two two big tips, man, for the purpose of improvement. Okay. So music production is very easy to do without any knowledge of music these days. People got taste. You can uh, you can get samples, and mm-hmm. you can get loops, and you can throw them together, and you can download presets, and you can download MIDI chord packs, and you can put stuff together that sounds good, and 
You can make entire tracks that way. And it's been done. It's been done well. You can do it well, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I think you will feel more powerful. You will speak a language you'll communicate with other people better, other artists, other producers, the more you actually know about music. And that's, with my background, you know, like years and years of piano lessons um, and like composing, trying to like decode theory in my spare time, you know, I have I have a certain way of looking at it, but I know it's intimidating to people. And part of my, you know, I think what I feel that I'm getting good at, I hope, I try to be good at, I try to like, make it a thing to do is to help people not be afraid of theory to demystify theory to make it something that's like this this is can be a feather in your cap this can be a tool in your woodshed something that allows it can't you, hurt you yeah exactly yeah. there's there's no there's no reason to be proud of not reading music there's no reason to be proud of well i don't play any instruments like um you you don't have to be ashamed of that but also like yeah, it can't hurt you to to gain more skills, to know how to do more stuff, to be a musician. Like, I have um, a saxophonist friend of mine. He tells his students, your life as a musician begins when you know all 12 scales. Mm, you know? And that's, that's like, that's sobering. Because like, on, on the piano, can I still play all 12 scales? I don't know. I'm a little rusty. But, but that's like something to aspire to, that your life as a musician doesn't just improve, but begins when you have command of music and like knowing chord progressions knowing melodies so and i don't want, i don't want that to be intimidating by the way like it's supposed to be encouraging that like you can be you can do music production without all that but if you add that to your skill set that just makes you more powerful what's what's point two because that was point one that do you want to just one. leave it at one point <laughs> don't just leave it there that was, point two that was great it's on the other side of it which is like me um learning to use the tools of microphones preamps DAWs, good recording techniques, uh, learning the plugins that are out there and mixing techniques. That's just as indispensable as learning the scales and the theory and everything. I think it's a good balance of both. And I feel like that stuff needs to be automatic in order yeah. for you to like creatively free throw, free yeah. For to to yeah to free ball creatively or whatever. Mm. Um, that's that's super interesting. Uh, the, on your point, on the point number one there about theory and knowing, getting to know, I think that's really do that really is important. I mean, I love how you said that it enhances your your communication capabilities, right? I, I really do believe that. Um, Rick Rubin is very famous, uh, one of the most famous producers ever, and he's especially famous for not. He always self claims that he doesn't really do anything. He doesn't know music theory. He doesn't know much. This book that I'm reading right now, Show Your Work by Austin Kleon, uh, there's a quote in there um, that I read today. Here's the plug. Right that there. I read today. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. Actually, let me pull it up right now because I, I think he worded it better than I ever would. Um, but he talks about the importance of taste. And everybody has got taste, you know. And this is something that I think Rick Rubin and those that people like – People and this is going to lead to a question. I promise. But first, I'm trying to like <laughs> trying to find the quote here. <laughs> um, let's see. But uh, basically, it was like at the beginning, everybody sucks. As a beginning producer, as a beginning mixer, everybody sucks. But you got into it because you have good taste. And although you may suck for the first few years, for the first few jobs, or whatever. The one thing that never changes is your killer taste. Rick Rubin is someone that is famous for his taste and can I say almost his taste alone because he is incapable as a musician, self, self-proclaimed, self not able to. How do you every day or throughout your life continue to hone and amplify your taste in your current productions? Well, let me first say that I disagree that everybody starts out with good taste because I don't think I had good taste when I started producing. Um, I grew up listening to my favorite band was Collective Soul and Collective Souls had some hits, but they I've also never have... even heard of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. So walk upon high. I like how your instinct is just stuck to the <laughs> you've, heard, you've heard this. You've heard this. I have. Okay. See my world below. And laugh for myself. Dude, I think you have high expectations. I hadn't even heard of Wonderwall well, until the tears two years ago. <laughs> down, Cause it's the world I had known. 
No? Nothing? Um, I'm sorry, dog. I'm sorry. Don't scream about. Don't speak of doubt. Turn your head. No, baby, just spit me out. No? Nothing? Okay, never mind. Sorry, dude. I'm sorry. Whoa, <laughs> never let your light shine down. Keep going, keep going, keep yeah, going. Right. Just a whole discography. I'll, hey, just, I'll just sing the whole thing. Uh, so Collective Soul, they've got some hits, um, but they, I, I've never met anybody else who had Collective Soul as their favorite band. So I, I feel like for me to like, when I was in high school, devour every single one of their albums was unusual. And... Not, not to say that like it's not good music or it's not bad, but it's never been something that I feel like informs the popular consciousness of of like what makes good pop music or what makes good rock music. Mm. And there were times that people would make fun of me for it, and I felt deeply uncool for my subconscious being just thoroughly populated with all the B sides of Collective Soul. Um, same thing with like to to a lesser extent, Dave Matthews Band. I know, like at least in Portland where I grew up. Lots of people liked Dave Matthews Band, but he that sound has not really percolated into the rest of pop music. It, you know, you don't hear Billie Eilish referencing <laughs> Dave Matthews Band <laughs> in her sound. So uh, for, a, for a while, I felt like my taste was more of a liability. And I was like, wow, the things that I listen to, the things that I respond to people don't really like them as much as I do. So I um, so here's here's how I see it. I think your your intuition is like a garden and you have to plant things there for them to come naturally to you and recall them. So if you want your intuition to just be full of good ideas, you have to absorb a lot of good ideas. Um, so it's something that I kind of have to... Well, first of all, I make myself open to all genres. There's not a style of music that I say like, I hate... Country music. I used to I say, I hate country music. I don't say that anymore because it's like... Dude, it's great. Country yeah. music can be great. It, obviously. and um, The white man's reggae. <laughs> you know? It's like every kind of music, obviously it's good because people like it. So be open to it. You know, absorb a lot of it. Classical. Um, classical is just like the rock and pop music of several hundred years ago. It has the same energy yeah. to it, you know? Except it sucks. <laughs> no, geez. No, geez. <laughs> okay well you know I'm teasing, I'm teasing. i just told you my I'm taste teasing. is terrible so you know no. <laughs> uh, yeah but no like yeah i think being let yourself be eclectic is what i'm saying and but also try to like find out what what people are listening to and and what what the popular consciousness responds to and what what their intuition is planted with so that you can have the ideas that they want you to have that they'll respond to Amazing, dude. I actually really like that. Um, actually, in 2021, my number one most played genre on Spotify in my Spotify rap was Baroque classical music. Oh. Yeah, dude. That I was, thought you were going to say city pop. No, yeah. it was. A, it, I was miserable that year. That, sh- that was a boring ass year. I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. you get, <laughs> I read a lot of books that year, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I read somewhere that uh, listening to Baroque music will help you pay attention better when you're reading. Did it work? I read a shit ton of books that year. Okay, well, there you I go. also like had no sense of humor that year. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. dude, it was it was it was a weird year. Yeah. And uh, I like classical music though. Okay, honestly, the, when I started working at Icon, um, and I sort of quickly learned how into EDM all the students were, I was a little bit like I don't understand the differences between genres, and I would try to like Google it to understand. It's like what. What oh, the like the like, super subgenres of EDM? Yeah, it's like, what is the difference between house and like trap house or, you know, um, future Garage. bass versus melodic bass yeah. versus, you know, yeah. Um, and then it occurred to me, it's like, oh, the like in the same way that like in classical music, a rondo is different from a, a scherzo, like these are all just dances and they're they're driven by the tempo and the way that your feet would naturally move to them. It's like, oh. That's the difference. I get it now. Dude, I remember watching yeah. a TikTok like a year or two ago and this like EDM head, he's talking about all the different subgenres and he's playing like a little clip of like the subgenre while I was trying to explain it. This is garage. This is a future bass. And like all of the comments were like, dude, did you change the song? <laughs> 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 I 
couldn't tell if it was a serious yeah. TikTok or not. I think he like purposely chose songs that sounded really <laughs> similar. Because <laughs> I'm sitting there like yeah. not learning anything, dude. <laughs> yeah. uh, not that I learn anything anytime ever, you yeah. know. But <laughs> that, that's that's hilarious. That's but really uh, cool. uh, yeah. dude, yeah, I think that. Dude, I, it's like people like you, it makes me realize like there's a lot of you. You are a person that plants hope in my life. Like, because I'm like, damn, there's people out there that don't get enough attention that are fucking great. Cause I, in the opposite sense, like when I see someone that gets a lot of attention, like that is mid, in my personal opinion, it's like that doesn't bring hope. But like I see people like you, it's like, damn, like this guy deserves a lot more attention, deserves a lot more credits. And it's like, it makes me remember, like working with you makes me remember why I got into music. And that Thank that you. is that, a blessing that honestly, that like, dude, and, and this episode has been really awesome. It's been fun. I get to goof around with you. There's like a really serious side of you and we can we can have serious ethical debates and it's awesome. There's like that side of both of us. But then I could say shit about pooping and, and we're having a good time, you know? It's been a, a very healthy amount of poop in the conversation. Yeah, dude. Uh, including- Because of all the fiber. Yeah, the fiber. Yep. Um, and the, the, what did you call it? The windpipe? The windy. <laughs> the windy? <laughs> the windy, dude. Actually, I think we found out that the windy actually isn't good for babies. Uh, oh, it's not good for butts. babies. Yeah. So maybe look into that before you use it. Dude, um, ending off this story with a great poop story. This is a <laughs> yes. real poop story. This is what, like, this is in August, no, September when I came back from Japan. Um, I was real clogged up. I th I don't know what it was I ate or if I was like really dehydrated. It was white rice, dude. Dude, uh, from from a dude that goes from pooping like like three to five times a day to like nothing for four days, I was in so much pain, dude. Mm, yeah. And um, I was to the point where I was taking like fiber medicine, Japanese, like like it wasn't um, laxatives, but it was like pretty close to it. Yeah. And I kept reading the bottle. It's like it's not supposed to be affected to the next day. I went as far as to get an enema. Do you know what an enema is? Oh yeah. It's a pipette you stick up your butt to like shoot fluid up to soften the stool. Dude, I went far, bro. I was like in pain. It was so bad. Um, and then it finally got to the point where like they don't the laxative that they had like right before we got on the flight. <laughs> back because we went to Okinawa and we were on the flight back to Wait, Tokyo. You, you did all this before getting on. Yeah, because I got I got clogged in Okinawa, like oh, okay. like, like something. Yeah. And then we were getting back on. It's like, dude, I was like, oh, if we're waiting for the flight. The flight's like eight hours away. We're just kind of killing time at the ball. I was like, I can't wait anymore. I I took some laxative, thinking that it would hit me in thirty minutes or something like that. Just like dump it out before this flight. I, they had castor oil, so I drank some castor oil, bro. And I read, I find then afterwards, I read the label. It's like this doesn't take effect for three to four hours and i was like that's fucking onboarding time i am i am stressed out of my mind dog i'm serious i'm like oh my gosh i got the sweats going i'm like i'm nervous and the nervousness isn't helping and so i'm anticipating that i'm gonna blow dude and and we get on the plane and there's a typhoon in okinawa so we almost couldn't get on and when we did get on the flight attendant's like this seatbelt sign is probably not gonna go off the entire time i am in duress dude oh, i can no. feel it coming but something about not moving at all like i held it the entire time but as soon as i got off that plane i almost shit my pants there's very few times that a man or a woman is closer to finding God than in those moments when you're about to <laughs> shit your pants. I don't know if I've ever prayed harder, dude. I probably... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Have you <laughs> I start... Those are my most sincere prayers, bro. This is, this is the part where our, our hunter-gatherer ancestors are like, you know what? I'm not that jealous of your lifestyle anymore. Dude, I am... I'm dude, just, I'm just out here in the woods at my leisure. Oh my gosh, dude! I was I was genuinely terrified. I was so terrified. It was all cool, cool. It felt good. I felt way relieved afterwards. Oh man, um, yeah. Caster work does not work in thirty minutes, ladies and gentlemen. That is the takeaway from this podcast episode. <laughs> yeah, no, switch, switch to brown rice. In the 30s. Switch, it, switch yeah. to brown rice. Um, thank you so much for joining this. Uh, this is this is our first episode of this segment. Honestly, I just wanted to... This seg by the way, I don't know if I told you what I'm going to call this segment. What the hell are we doing here? What is this? This is called... Uh, this segment of the Mixing Music Podcast is called Mixing It Up with Daddy D. Hey. So we're kind of going into it pretty goofy. Rad. Love it. You know, I, I want to give my kids 
a, a reminder that they have a healthy father figure. So I, I asked them, who's your daddy? You know, just to make sure that <laughs> they, there's a good healthy father relationship, you know? So, just checking to see if they yeah. say some other name. You yeah, know, who's just your to, daddy? Who's yeah. your daddy? Uh, anyway, um, thank you so much for listening. Go find Mike McClellan on, Mike McC- at Mike McClellan Music. Uh, really good guy. Hire this dude, man. Um, I, I'm sure that... Dude, Mike is one of the best, man. So hit him up. Thank you. I will say, yeah. I will say, he he's uh, because people hit me up, bro. He, people hit me up. The DM me. It's like I had a dude DM me last week that was like, "Do you do free mixes?" I'm like, "That's what you got from my podcast that I just offered." That's like, that's this guy seems bored and inexperienced. <laughs> like that's what you got. Out of- Damn, I took that personally. I shouldn't have. But uh, uh, Mike is very serious and is very talented. But if you have the budget for a production, hit this guy up. He will. He will. And and you are a musician. So if you are like trap R and B type person, um, you could probably save some money. But with Mike, if you're looking for real musicianship, for real instruments, some real bass bass lines, bro, and some real guitar. Some smacking guitar. Mike is the guy to hit up, um, and then have me mix it. A power combo, wombo combo, right, right here. Have DK mix it. Yeah. So, uh, um, thank you so much for joining, and thanks for hanging out with me, Mike. Yeah, thank you. This was fun. It's always a pleasure to hang out with you. Uh, tell your wife I said hi. Tell George Likewise. that uh, he's a good kid. Will do. Um, y'all need to come over more often. Thank you so much for listening, my friends. I think I don't know. Should we do a different sign off? I don't know. Uh, who's your dad? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Happy mixing, my friends, and stay saucy.